welcome to this week's D-Series webinar. My name is Carly Grant, and I'm the Entrepreneurship Program Manager for UCSF Rosenman Institute. Today, we're so lucky to have three of Oliver Wyman's team members joining us. We have Santiago Doria, a principal in the Health and Life Sciences practice, Hiab Tessima, a partner in the Digital and Health and Life Sciences, and John Lester, a partner in Oliver Wyman's digital practice. They've advised many healthcare companies and will be discussing how healthcare entities should think about where technology infrastructure plays biggest within enterprise strategies. They'll delve into how digital infrastructures can make healthcare more accessible, drive down the cost to serve, and expand the system's ability to manage the patients that need it most. Welcome. Uh, did we actually sign up to, to, to talk about all that? That's a lot. Uh, <laughs> that's a tall bill. All right. Uh, I, I, I like the challenge. Indeed. Excellent. Let's, and please, I, uh, as we get participants on the line, please use the Q&A function. We will, we don't want this to be an hour of us talking at you uh, as much as we want it to be a conversation. We're happy to pause at any time and answer questions. Um, we'll do a bit of the talking, but then let's let's have it be an interaction. Um, I think we can we can go ahead and get started. I'm gonna, in true consultant fashion, I'm gonna go ahead and put up some slides um, as we talk about digital in healthcare. And I'll start actually taking a step back from digital itself and talk about it. Where are we uh, as an industry? Because the last two years or so have have uh, come across as a tidal wave of change. So we we've picked up a couple of trends that are worth talking through. The first one is we are now in a recession territory. We can have an academic discussion about whether this is officially a recession or not. But we have gone through two quarters of negative GDP growth and inflation that continues. Uh, to create health inequities and continues to travel the healthcare and frankly, the overall consumer in the US. We're still dealing with COVID becoming endemic and localized waves in regions continuing um, to clog up the healthcare system. I was just talking to a healthcare executive, a health system executive today about how they're still dealing um, with high COVID cases within their hospitals. We're seeing a change in the trend of outpatient visits. We are, frankly, seeing a difference in how care is being delivered, and there's still open questions of what the long-term effect of that will be. We have the great renegotiation, as we call it, a favorable job market for employees, so that might be quickly changing, as well as employees who are now questioning the role that work has in their lives. We are seeing burnout at record high levels, both on the administrative side and particularly on the clinician side. We are talking to providers who tell us over the last three years, medicine has lost its joy. And as part of that, people are looking for new solutions, new opportunities that can help them regain control over their lives and frankly, over the relationship they have with their work. In 2021, we saw record profits for health plans and we saw record losses for health systems. And now as we go into the next couple of years, we're talking to health systems about how rates will have to increase and what impact that will have on both health plans and on consumers. And the reality is that amidst all that, the US is more politically divided than ever. We did research across the globe that tells us Almost 20% of people believe COVID is a hoax. Not that they're anti-mask, not that they're anti-vaxxers, but they believe COVID was created by the government and is now a hoax uh, that they have to live through. And if that weren't enough, we have nearly two times the mortality rate that continues amongst Black or African Americans as of, uh, as of March of this year. Health inequities or top of mind for the people that, um, that work in healthcare and continues to be a problem. That was quite the negative perhaps outlook, but that is just a, a context of where we are at 
uh, as we begin to talk about digital in healthcare. Yeah, uh, should we talk about bad weather? Can we can we add some things? Uh, let's let's uh, let's Go run on the school board here. Um, <laughs> it's actually quite sunny here in New Jersey. I'm, I'm, it's it's nice it's a nice day here. So, a <laughs> so, little, little, little bit of sunshine. Uh, yeah, it's not all, all negative. I think, John, to that point, let's talk about three targeted areas where we have input and where we're seeing great opportunities for digital and healthcare. We'll talk about improved access. That's the one that gets the most news, that gets the most presses. We've been talking about it for a while. We'll talk about optimized operations and we'll talk about the ever elusive actionable data in healthcare. I'll start with access. <laughs> and the question is physical or digital? And the answer is yes. In healthcare, we got this tendency to talk about absolutes. We talk about whether people have a PCP or they don't. We talk about whether they want virtual or physical and what are they going to go. And the reality, as it always is, is somewhere in the middle. I think a research has shown most people self-identify as having a primary care provider, that they may not see them as often as we typically think. And where we see a lot of opportunity is in the flexibility of how that care is being delivered. We are seeing consumers increasingly comfortable and asking um, for modes of care that go beyond the in-person uh, office and having to drive somewhere. And that's really where we're seeing innovators take advantage of that new consumer push. We're seeing the virtual first plans come along. We are seeing direct primary care offerings that try to push the boundary of what can be done virtually. And a lot of the digital health investment over the last couple of years has gone into how do we actually improve access in healthcare? What can we do virtually, what can we do on the phone? What can we do on the, at home? What can we do over text message? And while digital health funding has slowed down, I think Q3 was the slowest uh, amount of money put into the space over the last 11 quarters. There are still opportunities and people knocking at the door. And what's actually caused some of that challenge is the integration with operations. That is the, the reality check, if you will, of what's happening that's slowing down in the virtual visits. We saw a peak, we saw the news when the pandemic started about how many, pay, how many visits, outpatient visits were done virtually. We have seen that go down, frankly, over the last year or so. And I think that line at the bottom, going from 11 to five, hides a tale of two stories, if you will. There is the story of innovators, who are continuing to push the boundaries. And there is the story of incumbents who are struggling to integrate virtual and in-person and pushing consumers onto in-person. Hey, uh, Santi, can I ask a question? Please, uh, go for it. Um, so in my unsophisticated uh, way, I, um, uh, we, we basically, uh, I feel like virtual has for us, for my uh, three kids and my spouse, um, has replaced, mostly replaced like urgent clinics, which like, you know, years ago replaced having to go and get an appointment just to like do the throat swab and get antibiotics or like, you know, make sure it's not like whatever. Uh, um, yeah, now, now that's like teledoc or whatever it is. And it's a 30 second conversation um, that feels much more uh, mechanized rather than like a normal doctor visit. I, I don't know if that's like, like how much of the uh, persistent virtual is, uh, is stuff like that. It's, it's, you know, the most uh, bog standard, my throat hurts, my ear hurts, like, uh, et cetera stuff. Do we know? It's a good question on the acuity of telehealth visits. I, I would presume, I don't know off the top of my head, I would presume a high percentage are. Hey, a couple of thoughts that come to mind, John. Thank you for putting me on the spot. I appreciate it. There's one. I, I expect is, you to pay are, me back. I, I will no doubt. Uh, there's a question of induced demand, right? Are we actually yeah. seeing more utilization because of easier access? I think the answer is unequivocally yes. Um, right. If we, when we talk to innovators that have a fixed, call it price per month on the virtual visits, 
they'll yeah. say they're seeing a patient about twice per year. When we talk to our actuarial colleagues on what primary care utilization has historically been, they'll say about 0.8 to 1.2 for commercial yeah. consumers. So there's that point. And then within that, I, I think I mean, it's, a, it's a, that, I buy that, right? Like when I go, okay. uh, even for a simple doctor's visit, that is three to four hours I block out of my calendar for like driving, waiting, the unpredictable bit of waiting, exactly like, it. right? Like the, it's obviously not optimized around me. It's optimized around uh, someone else's day because they're the, like, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the reagent with the uh, least left. And so um, I get it, but yeah, okay. But I think the question that opens up in my mind is how much of that induced utilization can we actually use to reduce the utilization elsewhere? So the question is, are you seeing that virtual provider uh, and is that then allowing you to catch a problem early on early on, or do a treatment that's not as invasive uh, because that could, that got, you got that communication? In fact, when talking to health plans and providers, part of the benefit from their perspective is let me get more touch points with the consumer. Let me actually be able to direct their care. And there's no way to do that if I'm only talking to them uh, for 15 minutes in a crowded office every, every year. It's much easier when I get two, three, four times the number of touch points. Yeah. yeah. The, the other point of that, which I, 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 it's certainly a positive, is the point of behavioral health, right? And that's where... You know, the line on the top, if we look at it, we, we know that the U.S. is a bit of a nation in crisis when it comes to the undersupply, the fragmented behavioral health system. And virtual has really opened up uh, new possibilities for access and therefore improve outcomes. I think if I, if I look at the funding from digital health uh, over the last four or so years, mental health has been the number one spot. There's a question of what have we achieved with that? And there's a lot of noise in the system, but I think increasingly we are seeing particularly innovators shift away from this, hey, we're providing access and therefore we're better, to we are providing access and we have quantifiable clinical outcomes on how people are improving, uh, how people are improving. I'll piggyback, John, a little bit of what you were talking about, and Hiva, welcome your, your thoughts on this too. Some of the challenges, if I put myself uh, in the shoes of a health system or a plan working with an innovator around, hey, why am I not bringing in more of that technology into it is some of what we called out on the right. So this is, hey, I'm not able to transition between physical and virtual. And virtual is not, let me just put a tool into the EMR and let me get the video. It's also about, okay, how does my rooming workflow need to change? How does my scheduling need to change? How do I think differently about the rooms that are available for me to schedule? There's integration challenges. We've been talking interoperability probably since Fire came onto the scene 2014 as the end all be all solution. And we've gotten better about getting data from point A to point B. We have not gotten better about making that data actionable and making it such that clinicians spend less time looking at their desktops. Specific problem or scientific, valid scientific validation go hand in hand. There is too many solutions trying to be everything to everyone or without the proper clinical validation or studies around what outcomes are they actually improving. There's the user experience, which often is the other side of that integration challenge. We see too many innovators thinking about it, either all the way about user experience, but not the clinician experience, we're all the way about the clinician experience, but nothing about the user. And that's the, that's the question that we often work with around who should we pick and what are some of the pros and cons. Inability to create that clinical value, overclaiming capabilities to smoke and mirror that we often see the number of times we hear AI and machine learning as we talk about simple problems is tremendous, but what are you actually achieving? And then frankly, there's the health system cost. Have, we'll talk a bit more about this, but health system financials have taken a hit over the last couple of years. And that's by a thousand cuts. It's a very real problem we often hear from CIOs who have looked at point solutions and integrations and not, uh, and then look back a year later and say, we are paying for these 15 or so point solutions with no clear integration and no clear 
comprehensive strategy. Yeah. One, one thing I'll, I'll call out here, Santi, the, as, as nuanced and as complex as the healthcare landscape is, which contributes to quite a few of these challenges, we've seen a number of these challenges in other industries before healthcare. As we think about the financial services sector, uh, retail, et cetera, in which they, they too were trying to bolt on point solutions to solve individual problems. They too were trying to figure out how can we learn more about not the patient, but the consumer and how can we tie together different parts of data to get them there? So when I think about some of these challenges around integration, overclaiming capabilities, right? Vaporware, et cetera. It, it's, a, it's a perennial problem. And it's one that I think the, the investment cycle is catching up to some of those in the, in the healthcare landscape now too. But it's one that you do have to tackle the tech, where you do have to tackle the technology and some of the operations things hand in hand. Otherwise, you're not going to validate what you're trying to build and therefore won't get traction and therefore won't be fit for purpose. Yeah. I, Christine, you had uh, a hand up. Uh, do you have a comment question? Oh, no, I was pushing it by accident. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we, did, we did have a, uh, I think, a, a comment from, uh, it looked like uh, Harold, who just added another question. Um, let's see. Uh, so Harold says, last visit was 70% travel and 50%, 15% uh, weight. And uh, the quality of care for the in-person was less impressive than the virtual one. Um, yeah, uh, it's... Uh, uh, it's a uh, like particularly if you've not seen that provider before, like you just really never know like, kind of what you're going to show up to. Um, and that, and th and that number, that seventy percent number, can also get higher depending on other social determinants like transportation availability, et cetera. So you'll see yeah. you'll see the percentage of actual care delivery drop lower for more or more vulnerable populations. Um, all right, so Harold asks, what are your thoughts about healthcare consumerization and how to integrate related products into virtual health? For example, replacing blood draws with minimally invasive solutions to access biomarkers at home. Um, so uh, just as, as a general warning for everybody, I, I'm gonna pretend uh, to be the, uh, uh, a very dismissive, uh, not grumpy, but like cheerful uh, uh, person who, uh, is highly skeptical uh, of things for, uh, on this uh, on this discussion, um, and so because I'm going to be playing that role, I'm not I'm not going to uh, say anything to answer this question until one of my uh, fine friends here uh, starts us off. I I can take a pass, but let me give you my my unstructured thoughts. I think there's a couple there's a couple points. One, I think you got to affect the person that's paying the most for those blood draws and who's paying the most for those solutions. And that's often going to be the payer. And if it is the payer, there is a question on how do you develop a solution that is both driving experience, but also, um, but also saving costs and that stuff. I think Oscar has done a good job on it over the last couple of years. But even if I look at their retention numbers and their churn rates, they're comparable to other payers. And so when I think about how much Oscar has invested in the user experience, it hasn't shown some of those returns. And so maybe, uh, you know, it's not, it's not due its time yet, but there is a challenge uh, there. I think before we get to minimally invasive devices like Theranos, again, drawing blood for, uh, drawing blood, uh, for some indications, we can probably do a lot more at home. We can probably send someone on a band to pick up uh, uh, to do the blood samples. And I think that, that works a lot more in the MA space where the cost are higher and the reward for doing it is is also higher. But Sean, I don't know what your cynical viewpoint on it is. So uh, it's, um, I, one, I echo the, the point of, uh, the biggest challenge to consumer uh, centered anything in US healthcare is that consumers like pay about 10% of healthcare costs. Uh, and so, I uh, like my kids chip in maybe like 10% of, of the, the uh, kind of chores around the house, uh, despite my best efforts to raise that. I, my sense is that does not give them very much say in, in like how we're going to organize and run the household. It's just not going to happen. 
and, um, and I, I feel like uh, to the extent we are going to have uh, treatments and pharmaceuticals and uh, anything that falls under regulated uh, health care, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's going to follow the money. Now, I think in there's the way I think about it, at least, there is emerging a separate, largely separate set of kind of wellness, uh, much less regulated. And occasionally there's some stuff in the middle um, uh, where it is, it is consumer directed largely. Um, uh, and so I don't see those two markets like merging, I think as, as much as a lot of people tend to assume. Um, I, but I agree with you on home health, like the, uh, my, uh, understanding, which could be uh, usually as incorrect uh, and uh, incomplete is like the U.S. is like way behind, 30 years behind a lot of other countries on just like hospital at home, like basic hospital home stuff. Uh, not for any other reason other than the way uh, we happen to write uh, the requirements for Medicare or Medicaid payments, which um, to be eligible for those, you had to meet like a bunch of uh, kind of hospital safety codes, including like fire codes, and most people's homes do not meet hospital fire codes, and therefore CMS was not going to reimburse hospital at home if it was delivered like in a building without those fire codes. Uh, it was suspended during uh, COVID, and then there was an explosion of, of hospital at home. Um, so it's a purely a regulatory thing uh, yeah, uh, in the U.S. Uh, I was going to say. Perhaps to end on a better note about the impact uh, of access. I, look, we talk, there is a reality check. There are problems with integration. There are problems on how do you affect the person who's actually paying for the services. But success, as we put in our title, is not elusive. And we, we've seen examples where it's working. Right? If I go through this list, you have OSS uh, doing self-service triaging at the forefront of people getting into care, and we're increasingly seeing that being leveraged by health systems. You got Care First and their virtual first product being built, and we picked Care First because we like their experience, but you could also think about United and the growth they've had in the individual market with virtual first products. You got Auctioner building the Apple Genius Bar of health system devices. Even a health system like ProHealth, uh, thinking about how do we deliver virtual urgent care? So if I'm between the hours of 8 a.m. and midnight, I can get someone on the phone within 15 minutes to talk about my problem. You got Carbon and the fantastic work they've done with search engine optimization, making it easy to find them, making it easy for people to get in and increasingly connecting to other health systems across different areas. Forward, pushing the boundaries and what can be done digitally and what can be done um, physically. And to John's point, getting around some of the payment regulations by being a direct primary care offering. Sutter, they got a partnership with Ada on self-service. They got a, uh, their Terra Clinic for virtual first, seeing some of that growth. Transparent under Glenn, right, where encounters don't last seven minutes, <laughs> they last seven days, and they're mostly over text, so they can guide it to that point about it, uh, interactions. They can guide consumers to the best place of care. Babylon and the work on self-service triage in England, and mostly now in the U.S., acquiring uh, those value-based practices. One medical now with Amazon and excited to see what comes there. But even if I look at their functionalities today, they've done a lot of growth in what can be done asynchronously, what can be done over video and the ease of scheduling on their platform. Granted, you know, by, by building their own EHR. And then there's someone like Crossover who's pushing that boundary of, can I do most of it virtually, but actually not just put a banker on FaceTime, if you will, but actually say, let me do the visit virtually and let me ask you to come in person only for the things that you need to come in person for. So whether that's the that's the blood draw or that's the imaging, but let's try to do most of it virtually where it's most convenient. These are a few example and logos on a page. There are a lot more, but I also say there are people that are continuing to push the boundary. And I think as we're seeing more and more, perhaps valuations come down on digital, that opens up opportunities for players that are looking for new investment players that are looking for new technologies to incorporate, which is which is actually quite exciting in this space. Yeah. John, do you I, have anything I, you'd add on this axis to close it off? Um, I, I just say I I 
Yeah, I think most of the uh, success is going to be bringing folks who have scale and understand a bunch of the like really hard Byzantine stuff you have to do uh, 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 in a lot of these businesses. Um, so like large incumbents uh, with uh, people who are willing to kind of, you know, build and try things and uh, um, the ones that work can, uh, you know, hopefully find like good incumbent partners and they kind of both lean over. I, I think that's the best chance for like, um, uh, making steady, if not like, you know, explosive progress, but like steady progress on, okay, for this group of people that need care in these circumstances, here's a model that's better than the generic one that we uh, got used to. Um, All right, let's move on. Yeah, do you want to take us through optimized operations? Sure, let's do it. So not to go back to the negative side of the coin, but uh, Santi had alluded to this earlier about the margins that we're seeing in, in health systems. So I'm gonna focus on care delivery and, and hospital systems specifically because we're seeing the most pressure on their operations. And so I wanna spend some time about what they're doing to try to combat some of that. So the, the, the picture isn't great, right? As we talked about, hospitals are losing margin, health systems losing margin for a number of reasons. Labor and supply expenses continue to increase. Uh, we'll talk about shortages in a second, but supply chain everywhere, as many of you have noticed in other consumer markets, has been pressured. And the, the costs of delivering goods, the cost of sourcing and getting those goods uh, has not uh, gone back to normal levels since the pandemic. And so we're seeing that also start to hit hospital systems. Uh, drug expenses, we know, has also started to go up. And then on the de demand side, we've seen due to the kind of outpatient inpatient mixes that Santi referred to earlier, uh, utilization in emergency rooms, EDs, et cetera, going down. There has been a, a drop uh, in demand outside of COVID. And the, a lot of the elective surgeries have not kicked up yet um, since that drop off as well. And so overall, health systems aren't being pressured. And one of the, the hardest hit places within health systems are within our uh, healthcare workers, the personnel, the clinicians who went through a very difficult time in COVID and, and showed heroic efforts to kind of survive and haven't gotten a break. And so we're starting to see that they are starting to really feel the brunt of this or continuing to feel the brunt of this while we need to continue to combat kind of the, the increased supply pressure. I'm going to go to the next slide, Santi. So thinking about the, the clinicians and the burnout, et cetera, that we're talking about, there are already shortages and they're going to continue to get worse. So we're estimating by in the next, call it eight to 10 years, a, a huge shortage in the number of physicians and nurses. I think the average age of a nurse now is 50. And so there is a, a lack of entry into the, the beginning or the top of the funnel. And so we, we see that plus the other critical health workers shortages continuing to increase uh, over time. So not only are we seeing shortages start to emerge and start to get worse, but those who are staying in their job are burnt out. You know, we talked about the level of burnout clearly uh, at the end of the pandemic, but now it has continued where clinicians uh, are exhausted, burned out. A uh, high number have stated they are clinically depressed with an even higher number stating that they're feeling down about their jobs. Um, a quarter of physicians considering early retirement, that is, that is a big, big number especially given the shortages we're already seeing. And then 50% of physicians considering a job change with 12% with, uh, of those considering getting out of the medical profession entirely. And of the rest of them thinking about a change in setting, et cetera. And so the, the work environments that our clinicians and hospital staff are starting to uh, illuminate are not good. And so one of the places that medical systems, hospital systems have started to do is focus on the actual operations that the clinicians and the other rest of the healthcare workers are starting to revolve around and see, are there places where they can drive efficiency and through that efficiency, improve lifestyle, improved outcomes, uh, and, and things that'll actually keep them in their jobs moving forward. Uh, before I continue, I'll pause there. Any, Santi, John, anything you'd like to add? 
so I didn't uh, I didn't know until this week that um, uh, essentially there was a uh, prediction of a doctor uh, surplus in the United States uh, in the um, I guess the eighties uh, early nineties and uh, and there's a a pretty you know serious uh, set of steps taken to curtail uh, the training of new doctors uh, and reduce it um, and. Uh, yeah, it seems like that was a, a boner move um, on our part. Uh, we goofed that one. Um, but labor, labor is historically hard to predict, right? And how yeah. you, yeah, how you need to fill fill labor in different markets. And I think I think that problem is only going to get worse, not worse, but the problem is going to get more complex given the types of talent that are starting to fill some of these jobs and the move to a lot of the cool solutions that Santiago just mentioned requires a different talent model, different types of competencies and skill sets. And even for those who are you know, traditionally trained clinicians, there's going to be needs to upskill them a lot of times in some of these newer technologies or in ways that are different ways of working that were kind of ingrained in them in 10 years of education and then you know 15 years on the job, which is hard to overcome. Yeah. All right, enough negativity. So what are people doing, Santi? Let's see. So with amidst this backdrop, what we're starting to see or what we've continued to see are health systems looking to give their providers leverage and productivity, not just another tool, which is another training session that requires me to do my job 1% different and therefore it's going to be better, uh, but something that can actually either streamline the operations I'm doing today help me reimagine the way I spend my time as a clinician or as other parts of the uh, health system staff uh, and actually either improve outcomes or maintain outcomes while kind of streamlining and keeping costs and, and mental pressures down. And so there's some really exciting things happening. What, one thing I'll note as I go through some examples, you probably can't see some of these dates. A, lo a lot of these dates are pretty recent. And so you'll see that health systems, hospital systems are experimenting. Uh, some of these things that they're doing are pretty nascent. They're trying to figure out how to make them land in their systems. And the things that have existed for a bit longer uh, have just been that, a bit longer. So you're not seeing 10 to 15 years of data on how uh, different technological innovation has started to move uh, a bunch of the needles in terms of streamlining operations. And so I'm going to use that as framing as we go through some of the options. I mean, through some of the examples. Uh, firstly, nursing support. So in thinking about the amount of time clinicians spend, everyone wants to talk about getting folks to top of license. They up to 30% of what physicians themselves work on, they don't have to be working on and doing. Uh, they want to push that down to other parts of their team. And then if you go down to the rest of the APPs, et cetera, uh, we see nurses starting uh, doing, a, spending a lot of time, 30 plus percent on documentation, et cetera, that could be reduced. Uh, so that they can spend less time on the non-nursing administrative activities and actually spend more time uh, patient facing and doing things that actually uh, make their lives and patients' lives better. For the, for the nursing component, a major portion of that kind of admin non-nursing activity is around admission and discharge documentation, as well as actually gathering and delivering supplies. Uh, something as mundane as that, uh, is taking significant amounts of time from our clinical staff. And so some of the hospital systems are starting to innovate around that. You see Baptist Health uh, created a robot or two robots uh, named Moxie who go around and gather supplies to make sure that folks don't have to. So they are uh, able to go to central supply places, deliver PPE, samples and medication and kind of bring them to different rooms, get stuff left for patients at the front desk Things like that, that really take time from really strapped and busy nurses. They're starting to put that into place. They just announced it this month. And then Houston Methodist, uh, they have what they're calling nurse on a stick or virtual nurse, which has started to be piloted to think about how to do admission and discharge a bit differently. So instead of uh, as a patient, when you need to get out of the hospital, you don't have to wait for a specific nurse to come in and talk with your paperwork. They have a a uh, machine that comes and they have screens in the rooms and they have a core group of virtual nurses who are able to talk you through the admin, uh, the admission and discharge uh, instructions. They're one-on-one. -on -one. 
They can take their time. They don't have to go to another room. They're there to help you out. Uh, experimental piloting, but using technology in ways to kind of move folks to different parts of their license. Patient flow management quickly. Uh, Boston Children's and other hospitals are starting to actually use data and build dashboards to help predict where help predict admission and transfer rates and then uh, decide where to put people and manage their beds more more efficiently. As you can imagine, based on bed management, that can really have a high impact on patient flow and reducing the length of stay because they know, okay, someone's in the ED, here's will they pro will they be admitted or not based on that probability. We think they're going to need a bed. Based on that, we need to clear this other bed, et cetera. Uh, they've been doing that for a few years and started to put in some automated alerts around different thresholds uh, being exceeded so that they can manage things more proactively. Asset tracking and management, something as simple as an RFID chip placed in different uh, pieces of medical equipment, letting them know specifically within a building where something is. So there's less time spent running and trying to find the right supply or the right tool, all things that, uh, given the increased pressure on supply chain costs, uh, are super helpful, especially around inventory management. Then you have a whole plethora of other kind of streamlining tools that run the gamut of symptoms checking, triage, in-hospital experience for patients, optimizing clinical pathways. I'll say across a lot of these innovators, uh, there is a there is a focus on patients, but there is also for a lot of these, a focus on provider to make sure that these tools actually get used and implemented into their systems in a way that is uh, actually tractable as opposed to just pushed to the side. So uh, what, what I like about this is it is decidedly non-sexy. Um, so uh, I think everybody and, and uh, you know, certainly I and Oliver Wyman in general is uh, as guilty of this as anybody is um, you want to in the beginning you really want to try and do the cool stuff oh I want to I, I want to try and predict the um, uh, the incidence of, of something uh, bad uh, using this uh, uh, convolutional neural net on uh, a brain scan so, okay oh, oh we we'll beat the baseline it's very very cool um, uh, and then it's all it, it, you know, happy to expand on for a bunch of basic reasons. Uh, building the model is is like the first one percent, and all the hard work is after. Um, uh, and so, whether you're running a uh, you know hospital, uh, a airline, an airport, uh, a retail uh, uh, food store, um, uh, a uh, a logistics shipping company. It is, it is like what I think of as meat and potato uh, management, at like making better, slightly better decisions day by day, right? Um, you, you track actual data, you see, okay, we can, uh, if we do it this way today, we can like squeeze in an extra 3%. We do it this way um, and, and you build a discipline around that. It is not usually a, uh, a, you know, something that attracts like a lot of like, High valuation funding. Um, it's uh, it's like it doesn't instantly scale, but I think that's like actually what over the course of a decade delivers, you know, real changes um, in, in almost every organization where you have just a lot of people doing complicated things. Yeah, I I, I completely agree. The, the shiny object syndrome, and oftentimes it doesn't necessarily doing this kind of thing doesn't necessarily excite uh, senior leadership all the time either because. It's, the, the ROI takes a while to get there. Uh, it requires longevity and patience. But what it does do, this kind of work, in addition to what you mentioned, the folks at the coalface, right, the people who are the operators who do the things every day, feel, can feel the difference when you tell them, okay, someone is going to remove a mundane task from your daily to-do list, right? And when you can feel that difference, you, you get adoption, you get the elusive change management because you're actually improving lives in right. simple ways as opposed to really complicated ways. Yeah, yeah I like that. Cool. You want to go to the next slide, Santi? Of course, uh, as you go to implement these new types of tools and technology, uh, we need a reality check that the tech alone is not enough. I think we've, we've mentioned this a couple of times already today. Uh, Technology is great, innovation is great, 
but it can be a shiny object that sits on a shelf if you don't actually embed it in the organizations that need it. When we talk about embedding, there's a few things we always talk about. People and process, right? You have to have people lined up to do things in a different way. You have to create the processes around technology, especially in operations, that allow them to use that technology in a new way. And then also there's something about mindset, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, both for incumbents and for disruptors and how they need to think about uh, going after these things. So, so firstly, I mentioned the processes. The processes in healthcare, super complex, very widely distributed, very heavily regulated, just the perfect storm of, of uh, specificity and non-standardization that just makes process change damn near impossible. And when you have that, you actually have to spend just as much time on the process as you would on the technology in order for it to really come together and, and drive change. You have to be thoughtful about how the tech will be employed. You have to be deliberate about how you stage technology and use different tooling. And you have to be willing to say, you know what, there's not a good fit here. Something has to shift. We either have to change our process or we have to think about the tech in a different way. The center of those processes are us pesky humans. Um, you know, we, we naturally resist change. And I think I just saw a question come in about, will I lose my job? We, we naturally resist change. Part of the reason is concerns on, if I do this new thing, uh, will I eventually lose my job? Or will I become obsolete? Or, or, or. And so I think there's a few things we have to do. One, acknowledge that folks who work in healthcare oftentimes went to school for a long time to do it. They, they've been applying their craft for a long time. And so th they have a, a core set of experiences that help them arrive to where they are. You should, you should really, really kind of meet people where they are and understand those. And then anchor on, okay, how can I improve your experience? How can I improve your lifestyle? It's not just compensation, but improve your lifestyle. And then you know, hitting our quadruple aim how can I also improve the outcomes, right? So that people feel like this change is worth it, not just for me, but for the people I serve and the communities I serve. Uh, now for the mindset shifts. John alluded to this a second ago. There is a lot of value in small changes that accumulate over longer periods of time. And so that one to two to 3% change in someone's life or the bottom line of a department uh, it might be eh, for a year, but in 10 years, if you keep going on that journey, that can be pretty significant. We've seen that incumbents often don't have the, the patience and often have accountabilities that don't let them take that longer view. And so for, for the incumbents or the ones who deal with incumbents, you have to create the space for experimentation and learning and be patient about incorporating the results. On the flip side of that coin, for the disruptors and innovators among us, there needs to be an acknowledgement that where we are today in terms of operations was not arrived to kind of uh, willy-nilly. It was forged and evolved to over time through trying different things, through seeing which operational processes beat out. Sometimes there was sub-optimization happening, but overall, those things were arrived at for good reason. And so as you push for radical change or as you look to disrupt, pay attention to the constraints that made the system what it is today. And either address those constraints head on or acknowledge them in the way you design your technology and the way you kind of embed it in the organizations you're seeking to change. It's a big one. That's all I had. I don't know, uh, John, Santi, or any other questions? I don't see any. Yeah, any questions? Uh, um, yeah, please. Uh, All right. See, seeing All right. Move to data. Let's go yeah. on to data. Everyone's favorite topic. So, uh, <laughs> as I as I hinted, um, I will I will be playing uh, the part of a uh, a cheerful uh, skeptic here uh, rather than a grumpy old person. Um, uh, so, I think if you talk to anyone who has ran a health tech startup, uh, you know, uh, devoted several years of their life to it, whether or not it's still going or or not. Uh, talk to any of the uh, senior, mid-level, uh, you know, passionate uh, kind of leaders at different kinds of health organizations who spent, you know, spent uh, years, uh, in some cases decades, 
uh, trying to fundamentally change uh, the U.S. healthcare system. Uh, they have a set of lessons, uh, I think, from this last uh, uh, few years of enthusiasm and and hope and optimism uh, that got you know uh, everyone up to uh, President Obama and uh, at the time Vice President uh, Biden uh, like really excited um, and. Uh, you know, eventually culminated in a bunch of policy, which uh, all had as its intent to let's take advantage of advanced technology, digitization, data analytics, and let's uh, make healthcare much, much better in every possible way we can imagine. Um, it turns out uh, when you go talk to all these people who've lived through that, everybody's pretty disappointed and bummed out about how things turned out compared to like what the expectations were. And so um, when I think about why, uh, if I roll the tape back uh, and, and look at uh, how people were thinking a decade or so ago, um, I think one of the big uh, mistakes that we should try and avoid in the future is there was a sense that data, more data was just generically a good thing and a powerful thing. Um, and and I, I'll talk about two different ways uh, that shows up as a as a pretty big mistake uh, to just think of data generically. Um, so there's uh, when we say data, there's actually at least three different kinds of type of things that are very very different. Um, they're what I call data products, which are you know every time you uh, not today since uh, nobody does this anymore. Um, but uh, buy DVDs or when you watch Netflix or when you uh, buy a book, um, they, these are bits of data that somebody, some group of people have crafted explicitly for others, right? It is not a uh, internal personal or corporate or organizational use. These have been uh, specifically designed to, to give or sell in many cases to other people, um, but they kind of do it how they want to do it. Uh, there's a, a second category of data, which is uh, what I think of as, as compelled data or data submissions, where um, you know often a regulator or a, a government um, an agency basically says, I want to see this type of data from all of you, and I want it to look like this. And then a whole other group of people in a lot of different organizations have to make data that looks like that. So every, all the SEC filings for every uh, public company um, in the space of healthcare, all the adverse event uh, uh, filings you have to do uh, with FDA, uh, EHR meaningful use submissions over the last decade. There's a bunch of, of uh, things. These are usually for kind of, you know, designed for public good. And then there's this last category, which uh, I think is the, uh, is the thing that um, uh, often people who talk generically about the, the power of data this is actually what they're talking about, but they, I think, too often skip over. We skip over um, uh, what, what it actually is. It's not just data, it's data records, it's record keeping. It is a set of uh, records that a particular group of people uh, with a lot of time and effort wrote down because they wanted to come back and use that information for usually pretty soon. Um, it's uh, uh, so, you know, I've got like to do lists here. Uh, appointments on the calendar app. At every organization on earth now, there's a set of transactional databases, which uh, when you make a hotel reservation, that's where it goes. And so when you check into the hotel, that's they can look it up. Um, video surveillance, it's not you know designed for anybody's use except for the people who put up that camera and who uh, want to review it. Um, CRM systems, uh, again, like it, this is all groups of people saying, oh, I'm gonna like create and use this data for my own purpose. So next slide, uh, please Santi. Um, when you forget that like, uh, particularly those data records, unlike the first two are never designed for other people to use. They're designed for the people who, who uh, kind of created and uh, stored and cleaned and actually used the data, um, bad things happen. So I, I won't go through all of, of what I call uh, John Lester's laws of data. Uh, this is a draft. It's very exciting uh, at world premiere here. I'm sure it'll continue to be iterated. Um, uh, but these are, I, I think, uh, a selection of not just mine, but a lot of uh, people who've spent many years trying to do uh, 
innovative, powerful things with data and analytics and healthcare and elsewhere. Um, and this is like kind of the collective experience. Um, so if data is not actually valuable, generally specific data records are valued by specific people for specific purposes. Um, and if, you, if you're talking about data being valuable generally, uh, you probably haven't uh, thought enough or don't know enough um, to have a lot of confidence in anything, uh, any kind of view you might form of, of the future. Um, uh, if you think someone else's data records have what you need, you're wrong. This is, this is the normal, uh, I think all of us have spent a, a long time uh, very hopeful uh, that somebody sounds like it have exactly what we want. Uh, no, they never do. Um, so if you are a, a pharma company uh, who's working on innovative uh, precision medicine for uh, for cancers uh, uh, varieties, and you've got a uh, a community uh, that has like unbelievably customized, rich set of uh, um, longitudinal patient records and a bunch of other things on top of that uh, for exactly that. It sounds like exactly what you need. It will not be. Um, so every every kind of uh, person that's gone in that space has found that it is, you know, a lot of useful things and a lot of things that are missing and a lot of things that they have to spend a lot of money to add on to it. Um, uh, I think the uh, the fact that people like spend a lot of time and effort, particularly for data records, uh, the people who actually spend that time and effort, they think they own that. Regardless of what the law is, like data, those data records are, I think of them kind of like a house, right? Like the people who are going to use them every day, rely on them for their, their daily thing. They're the people who are going to do like little bits of daily maintenance to make sure it's still usable. Um, and they think of it as theirs, regardless of the legal uh, kind of ownership question. Um, and if uh, some other group of people would like to use their data, they might, they might be willing to give you a copy of it, but they're never gonna, like, without putting up a lot of roadblocks, uh, change, uh, easily change or welcome, like other people telling them how to store code, use data that they have been using uh, for a long time for their own purposes. And that, in a nutshell, is a story of EHR adoption in the US. Next slide, please. Um, I, I think, uh, um, again, like in, in 2009, uh, the US passed the High Tech Act, which among other things, um, put a bunch of money and a bunch of uh, uh, kind of carrots and sticks on, on the US healthcare system, and in particular on a lot of provider organizations. So basically, it's kind of an amazing feat uh, um, have tens of thousands of separate organizations in a ah, 10, 15 years, like essentially switch from mostly paper to mostly computers. It is probably the single largest distributed digitization effort in mankind his history. Um, it was also really, really uh, not well thought through uh, um, in its design in retrospect. Um, there's a general uh, belief, I think, uh, um, which you can go back to all the supporters of it, um, uh, that that putting all this data together, if we can just get it on computers, it, we will then have all this data and it has to be like extremely powerful. Um, and, and there was not uh, nearly as much, uh, I think, consideration of, uh, of uh, what do we mean by more data? Um, there, there is a version of more data, which if you find it, if you find yourself in this situation, you've been handed a huge winning lottery card. Um, if, if by massively more data, what people, uh, uh, if the situation actually is, oh, I have this like data set and it's pretty good for this like thing. And this thing is like, whether it's um, uh, drawing uh, uh, kids uh, books or driving a car, there are a lot of human beings who spend a lot of time on that and are like many of them are paid to do this. If I had a hundred times more data, uh, I might be able to actually replace that human completely. Uh, and a couple of years go by, it's the exact same shape of data, nature of data. I just have a hundred times as much. That is rare. But if you find yourself in that situation, you've 
are almost certainly um, have founded a Google or a Facebook or another company, all of which like that was how they made it. Um, or you are have produced one of the like really impressive uh, machine learning technologies of the last 10 years. Uh, this is where uh, deep learning and, and all the recent accomplishments actually show up. What happened in, in US healthcare and what's true of most spaces uh, and most uh, um, situations where people are getting excited about having more data, what they're actually talking about ends up being more data sets rather than a huge increase in the volume of data in one data set. Um, and having more data sets is, can be good, but it'll be a lot of work to see if it's useful. And then if it is, if you can do a lot of work and patch together uh, through interoperability or putting together genomic data with longitudinal data, it'll be a huge amount of work. And then um, just because we are where we are and people spent 50 years working on this problem uh, to improve uh, US healthcare, um, the, there's a way to do almost every problem already. Uh, um, and so most of the time, if you find uh, a good set of data and do some cool analytics, once you actually do all the work to get it into real workflows, real operations, real clinical processes, like a standard really good effect is, is maybe one to 5% improvement, like a one-off from like replacing this with that based on this uh, new data you carefully uh, curated. And that is, does not change the world, but it is the kind of like slow, slow steady progress that we were talking about earlier. Um, I, I think the, uh, it, it's incumbent on all of us to, in some ways to be responsible stewards of people's passion and, and drive to, to improve what is clearly a, um, a system with a, with a lot of uh, things that need to be improved. Um, I think it's, it's unfortunate to misdirect uh, a lot of passion and effort towards um, a belief that if we just digitize, if we just get the data, if we just apply AI, like then things will have to get really better like very quickly. That is, that is not really how things work uh, almost ever. Um, and so it, it, like, it is absolutely work worth doing, but it's going to be a lot of work and it's going to be small gains uh, um, that are local. Thoughts, questions? I think we're at time. We are, yeah. Thank you all so much for your wonderful presentation. It was great to have you all and yeah. Uh, if you have more questions, is there a way for folks to reach out to you or maybe you'll be back for another webinar? Yep, I think I think Santiago just dropped it in the okay. uh, in the chat. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, that's great. Thanks so much for having us. This is great. Yeah, thank you. All right, bye. Take care.